So we've come down into Cambridgeshire to the fantastic Decoy Lakes. It's a fantastic complex, brilliant, beautiful place. There's 274 pegs spread across 11 lakes on this fishery and they're quite diverse. You've got little lakes with the islands in, beasties and willows and uh, you've got the six islands at the back and then you've got these six strip lakes here which I've popped here today for episode four of Warts and All and today we're going to kind of look into how I'm going to approach fishing these venues with a feeder only. We've got a feeder masters qualifier coming up uh, very soon and it's not a venue that I've actually fished that much. I think this will be my fifth visit and they've previously been on feeder matches. So what I actually want to do today is talk you through how I'm going to approach not only a feeder only competition but a venue that I don't really know that well. I've got a little bit of experience, I've seen these lakes, I know that they're absolutely rammed with fish. There's loads and loads of carp in here and there's some big F1s but mainly today we'll be targeting carp on quite a narrow venue, it's about 20 metres wide with a feeder only approach. Now I will be fishing to feeder master's rules which means I can't use a bomb and I can't lose feeder with the catapult so I'll be feeding through bigger feeders or feeding through a method because it'll be method, predominantly method feeder fishing. I have brought some maggots I'll talk you through my baits in a little while and show you how I'm going to approach it from a bait point of view and then we'll move on to tackle and tactics and then I'm going to walk you through step by step a warts and all intro into how I'm going to tackle these baits. So we've got ourselves comfortable down here on peg nine on Oak Lake. As I've said, there's, these are strips, that's sort of 20, 22 metres wide there. And I'm coming into this, as I've said, with a feeder only approach. Now, there is a feeder masters uh, qualifier coming up on here, but we'll have a few of those, there's 20 of those through the year. And because obviously the style of fishing that I personally do, um, you know, with the international feeder scene, Feeder fishing and feeder only matches have become more and more popular in the UK, especially around the competitions that we've run. Uh, and just to give you kind of a bit of a background on, on those, because I think people sort of say feeder only, and what does that include? Well, it literally is what the name says it is, it's feeder only. So we can plumb up with a bomb, which is the first sort of thing that people always talk to us. So we'll find a swim and you can plumb the depth and everything else. But you must fish with a feeder in these competitions. Um, and then that then takes you, I suppose, on to feeding because you can't use a catapult and you can't lose feed by hand. And that's to kind of ensure that people who want to go feeder fishing, it literally is that. And the attraction of these matches is that there's a lot less preparation and a lot less kit needed to compete in something that has um, those sort of, you know, narrowed off rules really, because you're not gonna have to bring a bag full of catapults, you're not gonna have to bring a load of different rods if you're bomb fishing and you're firing it out there. and. And it kind of just makes it more of a level playing field. But more importantly for me, and the way that I think um, the, the appeal is, is for myself, is the small amount of prep. So when you come to somewhere like Decoy, for instance, I've just got some 10 foot rods and I've got one 11 foot rod if I was to draw, if this was a match, and I was to draw on something like Beastie, and there's a little bit of a chuck, a little bit further to an island, it could get windy and I might just need that extra bit of power in an 11 foot rod to get me there. So, from a tackle point of view, dead simple. I've got a 10 foot rod um, with me now, and you know, eight pound line. You're allowed to use elasticated feeders at this venue, so that'll be my feeder of choice today. And what we'll do is we'll approach this peg as I probably would do in a match scenario. And what I want to do is walk you through all the different aspects of how I approach that across a five hour session, and uh, and and tell you as the this series is called Warts and All of all the little wrinkles and things that might seem obvious to sort of experienced match anglers or experienced feeder anglers but not maybe common practice for most of you so let's walk you through it and uh, see how we go. on. So obviously as we've said it's going to be a nice simple session so we don't really need complicated bait we're just fishing a feeder today and obviously with uh, future competitions and visits in, in mind I'm going to try and keep it simple so I can try and work out how the fish are feeding. So my bait table for today basically is, I've knocked up some match method mix, which is the, the natural one, a lighter colour. The lakes are always coloured, 
So it's not like I've got to darken it off because I don't want to spook the fish. And we're feeding uh, pellets on here, um, fishery pellets you can use or normal pellets. I've just done some micros, which I'll show you in a moment. And that will match a similar colour. So I wanted to be able to see that bit and the use of that colour. So that's my ground bait, damped off if I need to feed down the edges or if I need to just put a bit of that on top of my method. I've got dead maggots, which I basically add in the fridge in water overnight. That's killed them. They're nice and limp, but it keeps the colour and also it keeps them nice and soft, which is great for when you're hooking. And I think when fish are sucking up, that's superb. A few live maggots. I've got a series of up baits. There's a few bandoms in there, but I'll probably be fishing today maggots on the hook or just normal pellets straight out of the bag. It's a great bait here. It's in the big fish is carp. We're coming into that time of year when they want to start feeding and they'll be quite happy to munch on some hard pellets. So that'd be a great up bait. And then that just leaves me with my micros, which you've seen me do this before. And just to run through it for the people that have not seen it, it's a cracking little foolproof method for how I prepare my micros. Early this morning, I filled this tub with dry micros. I've got a mixture in there of Fin Perfects and Pro Feeds. Fill it to the top, fill as, put as much water in there as I can, gently pour it in so it's brimming, clamp the lid on. I've left it there and basically I just give it a good squeeze just to tap all them out and they'll just nicely congealed and soaked. Just get my finger in. There we go. And as you've seen before, that they are self-preparing, nice and easy, fully soaked. The water's absorbed right through the pellets and they're still full whole and you can see every pellet and every shape and they've not kind of blown, they're not soggy. Each one has got the same amount of moisture and for fishing with a method, you can see, look at that, look, one little squeeze, just perfect. If you want to make them hard, you can do. If you want to touch them up with a bit of water, that's perfect as well. I just use a damp hand, probably split them pellets in half. I'll put some back in the tub to keep them fresh and you'll be able to do everything you want to do with them. Perfect. So that's today's bait offerings. Let's, um, let's go on with a bit of fishing. I'm looking at this venue today and although I have been to these lakes before and the last time I was here I was on the lake behind me and it was a feeder masters qualifier. I didn't quite get the approach right and what I actually learnt was that a lot of the fish will be sat shallow. It's not particularly a deep lake, five foot deep in the middle-ish. Uh, I've had a little chuck with a bomb and it's a count of two. And, um, and the fish are kind of all spread out. You know, the anglers wouldn't be uh, disturbing them. I personally don't particularly like chucking a bomb in and out because I don't want to disturb my swim. So what I'm actually going to do is start short. I'm just going to underhand the method to what I think would be you know, a short to medium pole line and try and pinch a couple of fish and then progressively I'll chase the fish across which is where I think they'll naturally back off to and then probably by the end of the session I'll either be tight against the far bank or if, and if this was a match situation and I had the room I'd be trying to maximise on these edges because the fish do want to push up into shallow water as the day gets on and the sun comes out and the, the water warms up they want to be in there and also they get used to um, f food down the edges and what they'll want to do is come in and feed um, so until they're ready to feed we'll go chasing them rather than trying to get them to come to us so I'm just going to start by underhanding this and I've packed that method quite tight in the bottom but not particularly packed it too hard on top because I just want to try and see if I've got a drop on one is my actual theory a quick fish so I want my bait to be quite open and ready for a bite quite quickly and that's what I meant by not particularly packing the top too hard not throwing it a long way it's not particularly deep I'm underhanded it's nice and gentle and in my opinion I've given myself the quickest chance to want to follow it straight down and try and get an early bite. So let's see how that short line goes on and we'll give that probably 15, 20 minutes and see if, uh, see where the fish are. And we'll look for indications and that'll give us some idea as to whether there's any fish in the area. So I have seen a few fish moving and they have been pretty much spread across from one bank to the other. 
not particularly um, in one place. There's a reasonably warm wind. I'm not going to say it's it's a it's a hot wind. It's not. Um, but it was nine degrees this morning when I left home, and it's probably 10, 11, 12 degrees. It's been cold nights. We've had some frost recently, but last night's been cloudy, and I think the fish should be still moving around, quite active. And let's see if we can uh, take advantage of that by hoping that the, f the feeding quite freely and aggressively. But we'll uh, we'll feel his way in, and I think that's probably the point to say that you sometimes need to feel your way into a match because, especially when you haven't got acres of water in front of you, that's your sort of allotted area of water, and you don't really. It's about swim management. And you've got to think about the match as a five-hour, um, you know, time duration. Probably the best thing to do is to try and divide that up and be brutal and honest with yourself and say, well, am I actually going to catch all day? Well, chances is no. Do you think it'll get better as the day goes on? Yeah, I would have thought it will. And that's my theory on this. So why would you go plundering your best areas, which I believe will be the far bank, and certainly past the middle and, and getting the, on, on that sort of far line progressively. So why would you go plundering that, scattering your fish, possibly pushing them out of your zoned area, if you like? So swim management is probably the massive, you know, the big thing to consider when approaching either a place that you don't really know or a venue that you've got limited pulling room. Uh, I mean, obviously I'm sat on my own today because we're on this practice, little cheeky practice, but it's also just to try and talk you through how I fish and um, think about, as I said, in a match conditions, you'll have an allotted uh, amount of water, use your swim and use the strengths and the weakness of it to your best advantage and stack the odds in your favour, which should result in a better catch. Now that's been in three minutes and I, th I have not had a line yet, which is surprising, I thought I would have done, but We'll just give that sort of 10 minute choke to see what's happening and then we'll have another, another pop and put some more bait in. Four minutes in and sure enough, we've got one. Glad I set that clutch because that's tore off. Of course, I think we were sort of six, seven metres, eight at the most, so we've not got a lot line between me and the fish, so they do go a bit crazy. And all I'd done is started on a six millard pellet with those micros that I'd obviously showed you how we prepared them earlier. So they've woken up. And he's pulling a bit, that one. I were only discussing the other day with somebody that this time of year you can usually get away with slightly lighter up length because the fish are still dormant from winter. They're just waking up. And sort of a month ago when you up to carp, they weren't particularly pulling back that hard but this one's certainly wide awake and not in a winter slumber and it's a common look they always seem to have plenty of giving them great fish here at decoy and he's not too happy he's got plenty of life in him so no no question as to whether he's come out of his winter slumber Lovely, beautifully hooked, right in the corner there, that's a cracking, cracking fish and a great way to start the session. So without a doubt that actually proves that 
what I'd said about starting short and not plundering your peg was absolutely right because, yeah, that might not have gone round first chuck like it did, but it did, and it's an eight pound start. And if you're looking for 15 fish, you already one up on everybody. And what I think happens is with these fish, you know, it's sort of, it's an even depth. It's a square lake. They're not particularly old up anywhere. Sometimes they're down at one end with the wind or um, up against another bank. And But ordinarily, I think they're quite spread out and it's the anglers and everybody casting and catching fish that corrals the fish and pushes them, you know, away and they just disappear and back off to safety. Why wouldn't they? But why go over the top of them? And that's something that I learned last time I was here, that I started too far and something I've tried to put right and we've done it. Let's see if we can get another one. Be greedy. So we're back in, and that's the third cast. And that went, well, it's only on two minutes 18 now. So did we drop on one off that second cast worth of feed? So even though we didn't go in and get loads of indications and two in two chucks and bag, just nice and steady away, and we're playing a second fish. Definitely a screamer. I have to say, although not everywhere is elasticated method stems, if it is allowed, I always fish it. I, I actually think it, you get less up pulls, less, less bounce offs, and it's just a lot nicer for playing fish on. And if there's some smaller fish, that definitely is an advantage. To not bumping them off. This one's all, all under the feet. The way this one's going, it wouldn't even surprise me if it were a barbel at first, but oh, it's not, it's just a good fish. And there is some belting fish in it, and that's one of them. There he is, another common. They always give up a good defence. That's almost a slightly smaller twin of the first one. And we'll take them all day long. There he is. Just put him back because he's still full of life. So, three casts in and two fish. So terminal tackle wise, um, obviously it's feeders, uh, it goes without saying. So today in our sort of attack, I'm planning to use uh, banjo feeders and method feeders. I've also brought some maggot feeders because decoy is a place that reacts to maggots. We're only just coming out of the cold uh, period of winter and it will certainly uh, be a good bait to switch to. I think pellets and hard pellets on the hook will be a great bait today because the fish are starting to feed, we've had a few warm spells, but if not, we've got that sort of maggot to fall back on. So maggot feeders, method feeders, banjo feeders, and then another part of the armoury for feeder only matches, 
because we can't feed with a catapult, we find ourselves to introduce an amount of bait, uh, bait up feeders basically. So I carry a small selection, um, you don't need tons for this game, and they sort of range from that sort of smallish uh, bait up feeder, that's a, a guru cage one, and then I've got slightly bigger um, mesh cage with a sort of ring bottom and a super large one. So if I want to, for instance, put a, an edge peg in, because of course it is a commercial and if you were fishing with a pole, um, these fish are used to people throwing lots of bait in the margins in large quantities, especially towards the end of the session when the fish want to come in and when they're really feeding and they want something to chomp on, you've got to create some sort of holding uh, bed of feed for them, then you'll need to put an amount of bait in and that'll be my feeder of choice. The beauty of the place today is that it is elasticated methods, which means I've basically just got a snap link swivel on the end of my line. So I can whip my elasticated feeder off, clip on a bait up, and the beauty of that means I can use the same rod. And if I do clip up to sort of a bankside margin, I've got a nice swim off down to my left there that's nice and shallow. If the fish want to come into that later on, then I can feed with this rod. I'll have a spare rod set up, clipped up to that, and I'll just be able to feed perfectly, clip my feeder on, drop it in on the top, I'll mark my line and fish off that. So nice and simple, but bait up feeders, for me, a really important part of feeder only matches because you do need on occasions to put an amount of bait in to create those swims. So that's the kit essentially. We'll move on to hooks and the finer points. Uh, we'll talk you through that and some nice little close ups and tell you what we're using. So there is fish number three. That's three carp in the first four casts, which I think has proved that starting short can actually be very productive. So what we're going to do is just push out into the middle to see if there's even more fish or if that line is the line. But that's what we're here for. We're having a little practice. It's a what's and all insight. So let's, uh, let's use this time accordingly. So we've had a great start and, you know, obviously we keep talking about the match conditions and putting it into theory. So we're working through this programme and we've had this opportunity three quick ones off that short line, reached out to probably 15 metres, caught one straight away, but then that line's gone dead as well. I dropped back to see if there any settled on that short bit because I had one little liner, and basically it's come to a grinding halt. So it's time for the next move, the next stage, which is to push further. So I'm gonna, not quite gonna go into the lion's mouth just yet, across but I'm actually going to go two thirds of the way across and because the wind's off my back I've seen a few fish moving around and all the fish seem to be into that wind that's probably turning the water over that little bit of warmth we've got from the sun that's out now and then fish are probably just subservice and they're enjoying that warmth so let's see if we can chase them across a little bit like I said two thirds I'm going to go leave myself somewhere to go for later on and let's see if the fish have settled there so off we off we go all the fish so far have all fell to that six mil hard pellet that we've banded. So I'm just going to continue with that because it's clearly not wrong. And we're still in plenty of deep water there, but we're well into the wind. So obviously we've pushed across into that um, sort of, you know, further reaches of the peg. There's been an odd fish moving. The ones that I have seen have all been in that wind. And I think, obviously, there's a little bit of warmth in that wind. Not particularly deep lakes. It turns the water over. And sometimes you find that the fish want to be in it. And today could be that. So I've just pushed that bit a little bit further across. Fishing into there. And let's see if that's where the fish are settled. It's actually a bit more of a cast. So I've gone overhead now. I've been underhanding it to the short line to start with. And then sort of to long pole line just before that but now I've gone over it I've actually clipped up and I'm just going to mark my line because if I do want to whip the clip off at least I've got a marker so I know where it is I just use one of these line markers there's quite a lot available on the market I'm not even sure where that one's from but I've had it quite a while it last forever and that means that if I do need to whip the clip off I can do but there's quite a lot of line between me and the fish so I should have enough stretch with that elastic, not to have to worry too much about taking that off. But because I'm chucking overhand, I just want to try and keep it fairly accurate. So obviously at the beginning we spoke about swim management and we spoke about the fact that we'd looked at where we'll be fishing. We've 
sort of predetermined uh, swims. And one of the ones that I mentioned was obviously a margin swim. And you've got to start thinking about how you're going to feed those pegs and at what time. Now, ordinarily, the fish come into the margins late into the match. It seems to be very effective on these fisheries to not to feed that at the start, but to hold back, as it were, and introduce that feed probably an hour before you're looking to go on it. Sometimes, you know, if the fish are quite aggressive and you think they're feeding, and you probably have to read the day on the day, you know, if, if you're absolutely emptying it and you're fishing out in open water and the fish are coming to bait, then you have to consider that when you do feed down the edges or anywhere else that you want to feed, the fish are going to come onto it quite aggressively, the chance that they might mop up, clean up and move off. So try and judge according to the day and how the fish are feeding, how long you need to feed before. If the fish are being cautious, on the other hand, then up to an hour can be quite effective. And that has not took long at all. And just interrupted what I was talking about, but I'll come back to that in a moment. So that's got us a fish first chuck on that further line. Quite an aggressive bite. Bites we've had so far have been almost dragging rod in. That one actually could see it, pick it up, try and shake the feeder. We had a, quite a sharp tap and a, and a drop back. That just tells me the fish would, it picked him up, shook his head, and then it is. So yet again, that six millard pellet doing the damage. I know from the past that hard pellet on a band fished in this way is a really good bait here. It's a coloured water and you know you could argue that the fish are actually working as much on grubbing around and they are on site, site feeding. So is the highly visible hook bait that important when the water is that coloured? I mean that's a debate for another day but it's certainly worked for us so far. So you'll have to excuse the uh, RAF, they do a great job, but not an ash of lads if you don't mind. But that is another beautiful decoy comment. Very obliging, thank you very much. I've got a lot going off, aircraft and everything. So that fish picked that bait up and swam towards us, so as I was just talking to you about clips, we didn't, um, we didn't need to whip him off, and we're good to go. I'll just get this back in. I've switched to a, a mould, because I'm burying my bait a little bit more. I'm chucking it a little bit further. I want my bait to hold in. I'm not trying to nick odd fish. I'm it's a nice depth there. I'm, um, that's funny there. I just, I just stopped him, and that's that's the proof in <laughs> the debate I always have about clips. I chucked that, and I thought that's bang on. And naturally, you stop the line with your finger, and I think it was about six inches off my clip. And I think more anglers are a lot more accurate than they actually realise. And I think they should be a little bit more confident in not fishing clips for that reason. So before, so, so rudely interrupted by a RF tornado, we were just talking about feeding. And um, we're talking about feeding that swim. So if it's a day where you don't particularly think the fish are really coming to bait and they're chomping, you might need to just put some bait in and let that settle and let the fish get confident over the top of it. And you, sort of an hour seems to be a really good uh, time scale as to when to feed down the edge and and then you have to consider what you're going to feed down the edge now obviously we're catching on pellets they're obviously coming to they're eating them we're picking fish up but we're fishing on a method and are we actually pinching one fish or are we building a, a swim when you're feeding down the margins you're trying to draw them in and hold them in and keep them grazing and maggots and ground bait seems to be for me personally 
great way to hold fish because they have to grub around a little bit more. It keeps them active. They can't just pick them pellets up, eat them all and disappear. They kind of disturb the ground, mate. The taste and the flavour is still there. They can sense it. Maggots, you know, I think they like pick them up, they chew them and they're into it. And it's a really good holding bait. I might drop a few micros in that as well. Um, as it warms up, I think you could then move on to hard pellet. You can put ground bait in hard pellet. Or even then progressing even further, where you would fill your, your feeding feeder up with, let's say, six mils and venues, you know, where you pester with smaller fish, even eight mils. And just use your softened micros that we use on this method to just cap off your feeder. So all you're feeding is basically pellets. But I'm gonna I'm gonna feed today with ground bait maggots because I think that'll be the right bait from past experience. So we'll see how that goes. And we'll start to look at feeding that ready so we can explore the edges going into the last hour. So we'll talk a little bit more in depth about the terminal tackle that I'm using. Um, these banjo feeders seem to work really well for me, especially when the water's still a bit cooler. Um, and what I mean by that is that sometimes I'll use a standard open end feeder, uh, you know, like a flat open method feeder, traditional style. But that all depends on how I feel about how much I want the bait to open up and how quick the fish are feeding. If you're going in and the feeder's hitting the bottom and you're getting bites straight away, I like to have, have a flat method feeder as opposed to the banjo, which holds the bait um, for a lot longer. And what, what I feel with the banjo is I can manually adjust and, and sort of micro adjust how I load the feeder by. I can press it in manually, fill that bottom layer in, which holds in tight, and that still gives me a target for my fish to focus on if I'm waiting for a bite and I feel that they're sort of milling round and wafting my pellets away and I've still got that core of bait that gives them a, the little trap to catch them on. Um, so I've started on that today. When I were underhanding, I just had a little 20 grammer because I were stealthing in, as I call it, just underhanding, trying to pinch fish, um, dropping on top of them and, and nick them as it were. But then when you go a little bit further, I think it's important to make sure that A, you're accurate, and sometimes a little bit more weight on your feeder. It's not just, you know, everybody thinks, well, I need a lot more weight to cast a lot further. You, you could cast 20, 20 gram um, to the other bank and back again. It's not that big here, it's not that wide, but you get a bit more control with a, an heavier feeder and that just allows you to get the feel of it and basically can control it, stop it, and it's a little bit more accurate and you get, you just get a feel for it. It's hard to explain, but um, I'm sure you know what I mean. So 20 gram and 30 gram in these circumstances is ample. I've just got the nice, long, elasticated stems, which I happen to have re-elasticated and I've just used a, a little rig ring on the bottom. I like that, I find it quite neat. My up length sits quite nice off it. And then we've dropped a four inch up length off. I've got one here that's just a, a normal hook, not an air rig, which I've got for maggots. And then the other one uh, has got a 14 um, KKH with, a, with just a band on. And I like to use a band because that gives me the option of using hard pellets or like a bandum. You know, you can either a wafter or a sinker. But basically, you've got the option. If you use a spike, which you might use for a, um, a wafter, you know, a bandum type, type bait, you've not got the ability then to put a hard pellet on. And as you know, you'll see from this today, an hard pellet's a brilliant bait. They're eating pellets, why wouldn't an hard pellet work? You'd fire them in, you'd fish them on a pole all day long. Um, you wouldn't put a bandum on a pole, so why would you put them on a feeder? I think it's a good bait. Maggot's an alternative. And that's pretty simple, simple rigs um, that obviously clearly catch your fish. So we've gone straight into that far bank at back of that rush bed not touching mud you know we'd love to have a little bit of room i think as the banks fell in it's like a bit of a nice flat plateau 
sure enough, indications for chuck, and we've just had a common about four or five pound. And already that tip's just moved. Clearly, as we suspected, instant win, instant fish. It's a sanctuary. If I were a fish, I think I'd be trying to get out of the way at anglers as well. So, we could have gone there straight away, and I'm sure we would have caught. But if they're not ready to settle, and they've not backed off, and the day's not progressed, and the water's not warm enough, are you then basically plundering uh, a, quick, a quick hit, but you're not stretching out your match, you're not managing your swim, another indication there. So, we've progressed slowly but surely, crossed to the far bank, and immediately that that's a fish, and if my theory is right, this should go round and keep going round because that's a nice fish holding area. It is a lovely little swim, is that over there? It's a nice bit of grass, so it's no surprise that there's fish there. But it just goes to prove to you fundamentally, it's all about swim management. And I've always had a theory which I always called www. Which was what do they want? Where do they want it? And when do they want it? The three W's, really important. It's the fundamentals of catching fish, understanding where they are, sort of depth-wise, distance-wise, that sort of thing. What time they're going to be there, swim management, of course, and what it is that you want to feed to catch them in their desired location. Just remember them three things, and that'd be really important. So we got one first chuck, and then we've had indications every single cast. I've had two pickups. What I mean by pickups, probably explain that. And it's like when you see liners, and it's a little gentle thing. You can see it flick off its fin, and you can kind of read your tip. And very important to read your tip. It tells you a lot about what's going off under the water. And those little gentle movements, the liners. But I've had a couple of what I think fish picking up the bait but it's not hooked itself properly. And I've had that twice. And I personally, I think the bottom there is a bit iffy. I've just cast in a little bit. I thought I'll just pull away from that where I think is a bit of rough bottom. So I've probably gone two or three feet to the right. And immediately I noticed that it took a lot longer for my feeder to get to the bottom. So the bottom's really uneven there. And I've, I've just had a liner, a proper liner, because I think, my line's up at air a bit more, it's not quite where the fish want to be. They're swimming about off that shallow plateau and it's just dragged my feeder in and I've wound it back. Um, so I've just tucked it tight up to them reeds and just off the bank a little bit because I'm hoping that that's a little bit smoother bottom. But that, is that a bite? That looked like, see that looked like a bite and it, a, a proper jag like that not a liner where it pulls it round and it's stuck on back of its fin so really interesting well oh, that's a that's off its back so loads of fish over there but we're not converting them which is really interesting now There's a couple of thoughts going through my mind. One is, are the fish really feeding? You know, obviously, yeah, I went in and got them straight away. Got three fish. They backed off quite quickly. Went to a fresh line, got one. Then struggled to get another, but got one. And then they backed off really quickly. Went to that two-thirds line, got one first chuck. Backed off really quickly. If you kind of look at it like that, are the fish busting to eat? seems not and although all the fish might be across quite clearly there's plenty of fish there are they actually chewing are they actually wanting to feed so times like that you've just got to consider oh, yeah you t your tips busy it's solid I should be catching loads of fish not necessarily sometimes you have to just be patient wait and get your pickups size of these fish you don't have to catch fast you know, if this were a match, we've still got loads of time left. You can still catch a big weight. But just wanted to 
explain to you that it's not all textbook. Great when we chucked in earlier, isn't it? Like that, round, dead simple, drag your rod in, it's like shelling peas. All of a sudden, same bait, same muck, same, same, but not quite right. So it's either they're not feeding properly, or there's a ton of fish there, not got their heads down, or is it that the bottom's not quite right for them? But we'll just explore, and I'll have a little cast around. It might be they have to go to the other side of that sedge and find a nice smooth bottom because it makes a massive difference if it's rocky and lumpy and there's bricks and bits of old bank down there you just won't get a clean pick up and you won't be able to hook your fish properly but we'll carry on going through motions and see if we can't either find a nice spot might be that we have to go super tight who knows um, but we'll try a few things and we'll talk you through them as we're fishing so that's another indication that's a lot of indications without the tip going round. And as I said, I've had a couple where I've been convinced they've picked it up and not got a proper cold, which has resulted in no fish. So, with those weird indications and then false pickups, the next cast I've just put probably three metres to the right. So it looks like the bank's not fell in there. As my feeder landed, it's quite obvious it was really shallow. But it landed hard, nice and clean, and I've just had a lovely pickup bite basically dink picked my feeder up dropped back and I've picked up and it were already swimming towards us because we were fishing really tight I think the fish has picked bait up and tried to swim for open water and it's a barbel look at that now then I wasn't expecting that there's a lot of these in decoy and ordinarily if you catch one you'll catch a few that's probably why it were a different kind of bite. Get him. I'm gonna have to get me uh, technical equipment out. That beauty. Absolutely immaculate fish. Full of muscle. Pop him in there. And we'll see if that little marker we've chucked to is the glory hole. And sometimes these types of lake where the banks like that, it's really difficult to get it accurate and that. Yep. Happy with that. You'll see there were no no drop on the feeder because that is really shallow water. Really shallow water. Let's see if there's a nest of barbel there.
Someone just moved my feeder. And again, that'll be on. Completely different bites. And that's probably because we're just balancing on a really shallow ledge because they've picked it up and then come towards us. So we, we, we are really tight up against that mud. So, subtle little change. Even though we were getting indications, oh yeah, it's solid, loads of fish there. You've got to convert them, you can be quite a busy fool. You might think that you're probably packing your feeder on, you might think you got the wrong up bait on. It was nothing to do with that. I'm not saying that I completely proved it, but I still think that that bottom where I started casting, even though I thought it was a nice, lovely plateau with the right depth, probably just hasn't got a small enough bottom to get the pickups. And we've had two chucks up against that tight little grassy, the grassy knoll, and two fish. They're certainly fit fish. But they're not small either. I think smallest fish we've had today is five pound. And you can see why the weights are so good. This lad's not getting in. That elastic just does take care. all those lunges and does allow you to really pull you'll probably see that rod in some people's minds <laughs> I've got it bent through the corks but that old 15 line he's a big lad it's a good job he's got a small tail otherwise we'd be in trouble here Really, I'm applying pressure. Which just goes to show you what I mentioned right at the start of the session that fish aren't, <laughs> I was going to say aren't pulling like they do in summer. It's probably making a liar out of me, but we've got that O15, the O15 on. You don't need super heavy line most important thing first things first is get a bite and the lightest you can get away with the better in winter you can probably get away with all 13 quite easily I've even known caught no 11 big old mirror look there it is a bit of a lump He's a big one. Cracking fish. And he was absolutely gobbed that. So he's gone right up against that, tight against that far bank. And absolutely nailed that, that pellet. Look at him. He's a, a cracking fish. So as we mentioned earlier, the fish, having chucked across to the far bank, and it's obviously, there's fish there, they're happy to be in shallow, shallow water, up against the margin, up against that bank. So now's the time to take that feeding feeder, just clipped it on to that, and I'm just gonna put some bait alongside that. That sort of sedge there, just like that empty. 
just empty that out and I'm going to put the next one a little bit closer so I can get make sure that I've got some in really deep water yep in really shallow water rather because I definitely got a fall on that then I'm not going to pack that too hard because I pretty much want that to empty nice and easy so quite a nice amount of bait in there and that a little bit far yeah but that's that's a little bit shallow that's emptied straight away and I'm just going to put my last one on the top of that I'm ramming some dead maggots and they love maggots here there it is perfect and then we'll leave that for 30 to 40 minutes and that should just be enough to hold a few of them big fish I'm going to leave that on in case we're getting one a chuck across and I might need to top that up and we'll come back onto that later so we're coming into the closing stages of the session and the amount of fish we've caught across tells me that that's going to be a great line there and if I say so myself I couldn't have run down there and dropped that in better by hand just get that set so I can get that on my rest Because of course when I was feeding I would chuck into that clip but not necessarily thinking about printing my rest. So I've just took a little bit off. Let's see if we can't get one. It's an interesting time of year. As I mentioned earlier, the fish are coming out of hibernation and only four or five weeks ago, they didn't really want to feed. They were all tightly shoaled and you had to kind of work really hard to, to get a weight. The fish were lethargic and not really moving. I've just had a line straight away and that is actually on. And that, oh, that might not actually be Can't that? I might actually be. That was quite a small fish, and that's interesting because I've actually gone in with maggots. I think it's an F1. And I just had the other rig, two maggots on, and ground bait, and it's gone straight away. Always welcome, but not quite the eight pounders we've been catching. But still a lovely F1. Drop him in. We'll go again. We'll keep his eye on what we're catching, and if we feel that the ground bait and maggots is actually not right. Because, of course, we've caught them pellets across, so why won't it be right for this, this edge? But might need to just dampen that ground bait up a little bit. I'll get a good squeeze. Obviously, it worked last cast, but need to get it right so that it's staying on. There you go. Nice little bit of depth there. So quite clearly them fish have come onto that, but what I've actually done is switched to the same sort of rig and bait as we were using across because I had an F1 and then I had a bit of a funny bite and a fish came off and 
And of course, as I said earlier, what, where and when, and they've been eating pellets, they want pellets. Yeah, they've come to that ground bit, obviously, and they're maggots. So I've put pellets on the feeder and the trusted six mil in that band. And sure enough, that's a carp. So, I suppose that just concludes that, as I said earlier, they're getting that time of year, they're warming up and they're wanting to eat, and hard pellets is a fantastic bait in early season, like this. And that's a nice little mirror. Probably one of our smallest fish, four to five pounds. That kind of just proves to us that the fish are definitely in shallow water. This margin swim and that swim on the far bank, really shallow. We took advantage of some early opportunities fish, took what we could and maximised on our opportunities. I suppose if we were in a match and it was super fierce and we were really pushing hard, you'd be looking to get everything you could, use your peg to its full advantage and uh, obviously come up with a good weight. We've caught lots of fish and I hope that we've probably explained a few things about feeder only matches, um, how to approach things. As always, I always try and keep my bait tray and my tackle very, very simple because there's enough going off in your peg. And I think today has been a good example of that, reading your tape, seeing where the fish are. And sometimes you can get lost in different oaks, different uplands, different feeders, this bait, that bait. And ultimately we're about reading the swim as opposed to confusing it in your own mind and on your side tray. So, yes, we've come here to look at a practice for a match. And one thing I will say that it's always hard to practice and, and try and, oh, I've got, I've got a match here, I need to work out how I'm gonna fish it. Keep an open mind because ultimately, we've probably done more proving of tackle than we have um, the exact formula of how to fish and what to fish with. Because every day is different. You know, you come next time, the wind's in a different direction, or you're on the opposite bank. The fish aren't over here because there's no wind here. They're all going down the middle, all might be at one end. So keep an open mind when you're fishing and don't try and say, oh, I've cracked it, that's what I'm going to do. I'm off to a match there in two weeks. Just know that you've got the weight of the feeders right, the hook will handle all the fish, your line will handle your fish, your rods are right, the main lines, you set up that sort of thing and then work on the intricacies of, as I said earlier, the three W's, what, where and when. If you stick to those simple fundamental rules, the fishing should fall into place and hopefully you'll have some success. I'm looking forward to coming back here for a match and uh, if you get a chance to visit Deco, it's a fantastic venue with some beautiful fish and I hope you enjoy it as much as I've done today.